All right, welcome back, Axe Hounds, to the Axe Hounds podcast, a podcast just for axes. Uh, this is Leaf and Chris back again for episode three, and we thought we'd uh, we'd step our foot into the controversial topics uh, for the first time, and maybe uh, you know spark some conversation, ruffle ruffle some feathers. Uh, and maybe we'll do this periodically because just as as many good information that's out there about axes collecting use and, uh, there's just as much bad information. And, uh, I think Chris would agree that no, we're not experts. No, nope. but no. Nope. Um, however, I think we, I think we could be, it would be safe to say that we have a firm grasp on the basics, um, without patting ourselves on the back. You know what I mean? And we speak from a place of experience. Definitely. And with that, let's jump right in. I think uh, easiest one to cover is a topic that came up. It's come up actually a couple times recently uh, in the uh, in the groups, and uh, that's the uh, the myths and malarkey about wedge wedging. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> Sparks. Uh, uh, I think I think our group not counting others, uh, did a very good job without jumping off the cliff. You know what I mean? As far as outrage culture, I mean, everybody's got good points. Um, you know, and there's a conclusion to come out of all of it, but, uh, you know, I think between Chris and I, we've, I think we've tried just about everything in a diff. you know what I mean? I've I've tried both hard and soft wedges and I can't say that I have a preference either way. And I, you know, I've done both, several species of both. Um, I do like working with poplar when I can hand select the wedging grain and all that stuff. But I can make anything work with a little bit of patience. So I don't, you know, in the end, I don't think it it really matters uh, when it comes down to it. And it and it certainly doesn't matter enough to uh, to hold an opinion so hard that you attack others for it, because that seems really silly. I it's, think it said in the the thread that was brought up, it's a good argument could be made both ways. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I I guess for me, I lean, and this is just a philosophy. And there's no proof behind this, but I lean towards a soft wedge because my thoughts are, if you, you put a big fat wedge in there and it's softer than the handle material, more of that wood is going to squeeze into that curve. Versus if you have a hardwood, it's not going to give as much. Therefore, we're not putting as, as much in the wedge. Now, either way, as long as the head is splayed out above the top of the eye, the ha- axe isn't going anywhere. So it's not going anywhere. Yep. You're, you're winning either way. I think how you do it is more important than what type of wood you use. I think that's, you know what, that's, um, that's a perfect direction to steer this. And, uh, I know Chris does, uh, I know I do and several others. It's not like we're providing any new information, but it may be new information for people who don't, who don't get this detail, but like, um, regardless of which wood species I'm using for a wedge, um, my results can end up the same, but I prep my wedge, I size it. I match it to the eye to, I mean, I, I have like several, I don't even, I haven't even made all the ax tips yet or the steps I take to when I, when I really want to do one nice, um, that I take to have that wedge fill my curve to the bottom and, and be clean and splay the, and splay the top over the, um, over the top of the eye, which there is another, I mean, we didn't even put that on this one, uh, which is, we could probably do another topic on that altogether about putting the mushroom in the eye or the neck over the eye. Yeah. The flush or leave it pronounced. Yeah. That's, it's literally like a 30 minute podcast by itself. Uh, (laughs) But like with wedging, um, you know, I, I take a time to, I bevel the back of the wedge because the back of the eye has got a, a half circle in it. I take that time. My wedge fits down into the depth of my eye three quarters of the way before the, for the bottom of the wedge starts hitting the wall. So when I, when I, when I slap that sucker down in there, I, you know, I've, I've fit it and I've gave it a little bit of squeeze at the bottom. 
And I do a little bit of measuring to make sure, and especially like with a hardwood wedge, if I've done an oak or a maple, uh, if you don't get the if you don't get the thickness right, if you get it too thick, it's going to lock up. You're not going to bottom out, and I, you should really shoot for that. Do you have to do it every time? No, but I mean, why not? Why not go for broke? You know what I mean? I think it's important to take the time to prep the wedge, make the wedge fit the eye, make it fit the curve, know what depth. Like put a line on the on the wedge so you know when you're pounding in and it stops moving, you can look at that reference line. Yeah, it's bottomed out. Like you, these are all important steps, more important than what type of wood you used. Yep, it's, yep, for sure. It doesn't matter what wood you put in there. If you didn't get the wedge deep enough, it's going to back out. If you didn't cut the wedge to the right width, it's going to split. If you didn't take the time to chamfer edges in that, it's going to peel the, the wood off the side of the wedges, um, mm -hmm. which is not good. I mean, you want the whole point of it is, is to wedge the wood into the curve. Like, that's by definition. <laughs> it's a wedge. So, you know what? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's more important to prep and install the wedge than it is what freaking wood you use. Yeah, I've made, you know, I, I've even gone the soft end. Uh, I remember I was playing around with eastern white pine, and I was squeezing half-inch wide wedges down into a, a three-eighths hole, you know what I mean, curve, curve size, but because it was so spongy, and I have a heavy weighted mallet that the percussion's nice, that I, you can just keep walking that wedge down in, as long as your neck holds up, of course. You know, and some guys will say, I'm quite certain, well, I just pound anything out of there. I never have an issue. It's not... Uh, it's not walking right out and chopping some trees. It's the five years from now, the six years from now that you're swinging that ax and you got to deal with a deal with a loose head that you end up cutting corners to, to tighten up is why you go through the trouble of getting the wedge right in the first place. Yeah. So I've been using the same bushcraft ax for, you know, it's when did I make, I don't even know when I made that. It was back when I lived in the apartment that head is as snug as the day that I put it on. Because I took all those steps, and to, nobody could tell me that one in particular doesn't have a lot of a lot of use on it. I've chopped some really questionable stuff with that thing, and uh, you know the proof is in the pudding. And with that, though, I think we can step into slight more controversial things like uh, wedge lube. Do you or don't you? And what's the best choice? And I'll tell you what: there's just as many opinions on that as there is the uh, the wood species you use to put in the put in the neck. So. <laughs> I don't know if you want to go with that one, if you like. So I, I don't, I don't use wedge lube unless you want to call glue wedge lube, and that's kind of a side controversy, I guess. Um, I used to try to put uh, boiled linseed oil on my wedges and impound them, and one time when I was doing that, I set my wedge, walked away from the axe. Three seconds later, the wedge shot across the freaking shop like a gunshot. That's awesome. I'm not even exaggerating. The, it was under so much pressure that the added lube or boiled in seal allowed that wedge to back out. So it made me think about something. It's oil, so it is. it does reduce friction. So it made me think, well, maybe, maybe it was too tight or whatever, but let's say it wasn't too tight. What's going to happen to that wedge? Eventually, it's going to back out. So, I don't use I don't use any oil on my wedges. I use glue. My philosophy on the glue is: <clears throat> people say they don't use glue, and this is their argument. I don't use glue because you take the axe in and outside. The wood expands and contracts. Blah blah blah. Heads start loosening up. You need to pound the wedge deeper and and tighten the head. Well, you just ex you just diagnosed what the problem was to begin with. Yeah, yeah. You didn't set the wedge deep enough. So if you do the proper prep work with the wedge and the wedge is bottomed out, if you glue it, then the wedge can't back out. Therefore, you're never going to have to reset that wedge. If, if everything shrinks, which is highly unlikely, it would take many years. It's not going to take in and out of a house overnight. If everything shrinks, and I'm talking you hung this axe right, everything's swollen above and below the eye. Um, if it 
it's not going to shrink to the point where you're going to have to repound the wedge. And if you've already had the wedge bottomed out and it can't back out and there's, you have a loose head problem. We got another problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah, not going to, you're not going to pound the wedge any deeper. Yeah. Your, your stick was green <laughs> when it went in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like Chris, I, I've used both. Um, so far I've never had a wedge back out with the oil. Um, but Chris is not the first person that's had that happen. So it's certainly something to think about. Uh, when I used to put wedges in, I used to soak everything in oil uh, when I when I put them through. Five, five or so I've done. I literally am just putting a wetting of it on there um, to start with and then getting it all the way down and then dressing the, um, the cleaned... Uh, the clean kerf and, and uh, neck with oil after that, probably getting something more expansion, but I've dropped it down in there. So I don't have an issue where I might have so much lubricant on that wedge that it might back out on me. Um, but I've done wood glue too. I have wood glue ones behind me and I used oil, but like Chris and I keep saying, I, even then, you know, in the end, if you're not getting the right sized wedge in there and you're not getting it bottomed out like you should, um, you can run into issues all the way around. So I don't think it really matters. I think there could be a case made maybe with certain types of adhesive that you use on them. Maybe uh, when you put a, when you start drilling down, you get that wedge halfway through, you can generate a lot of friction and heat, which may cause some cheaper glues to set up really fast. Uh, but I, I, other than that, I can't see, uh, see there being any really issues. I've never had an issue. Yeah. My other thought process on that whole deal is if you put everything together dry, and then add oil, what's it going to do? Expand. Mm -hmm. If you started with an oil-soaked wedge, it's already expanded. So when that oil dries up, it's going to shrink. So Yeah, I'm using less and less, and I'm doing it, doing more after I've got the, you know, I've got the wedge set into the curve. And do that's, prep, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do your prep work, put it together dry, use glue, don't use glue, whatever. I use it because my thought is, is if it's glued in, it can't back out ever. Because a, a glued glued wood, usually the wood will fail before the joint will. Mm -hmm. And then once all that's done, then you add your oil. Then it just freaking blows up and it, it's never going anywhere. And in the end, <laughs> when it comes down to it, go with what you know and what works well for you. Yep. But uh, and the only time you you should uh, question your methods is if you constantly keep having a, a loosening problem. Then I say that's the only time for you to address it. Uh, you know, in the end, I don't think Chris and I are here to make definitive statements on anything. And uh, and a few years ago, I might have not said something like that personally. But uh, I've definitely changed my view on a lot of things, and we'll get to that later. Um, but uh, moving down from the head down to the uh, the handle. A uh, big topic that comes up in myths and malarkey is grain orientation and uh, when it really matters. Um, without saying the philosophy word too much, I mean, my personal opinion is grain matters much less the shorter the handle gets to me. The longer the handle starts to get, the more grain starts to to come into my <clears throat> my concern. Correct. And I, that's that's it. That's as far, you know that's really as far as I take it. You know, once I get into some curvy handles, like at the French curves, obviously, you know, that forward to back grain orientation is obviously important, you know, with, especially with the way the curves go on that. If you have run out, um, I just had an axe last year uh, that had run out in the grain on a French curve, and I watch that thing blow right in half along the run out. Um, it's it, what happens. But like I said, um, the shorter the handle gets, the far less I'm concerned about grain, grain orientation. And if you want to say something on that, you go right ahead, sir. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I've seen a lot of axes because I collect. So I, I've owned a lot of axes have passed through my hands. And I've seen a lot of vintage new old stock axes, especially here recently. And... All of the failures I've seen on every every axe that's in my garage, every failure is up by the 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 neck of the handle from overstrike. Mm -hmm. 
and these hexes are used. Like they're beat up. The freaking poles are mushroomed. They went through some abuse. So I think the ratio of failures due to grain orientation are a lot less than improper use. Oh, yes, absolutely, for sure. Yeah. I think people get caught on this. They get so hung up on how, how they want this grain to be perfect. And, you know, the reality is, is trees don't grow like that. Like, they, we don't have big monster trees anymore. Um, so getting a straight plank out of a tree where the grain is perfectly parallel is just, it's next to impossible. I mean, they're cutting down trees that are, you know, 12 inch in diameter and turning them into axe handles. I mean, mm -hmm. and even in the old days, I don't think that they, when Kelly Perfect put out an axe and put out a thousand of them, they didn't make sure there was a thousand perfectly straight grain handles no that's uh, a fact because i you and i have both seen some that were not like 100 yeah. percent grain orientation perfect you know well in theory i know where everyone's coming from you know if the grain's wrong it's it's like the leaf spring is going to split blah 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 well in practice it, it turns out that it's not exactly true your most what you need to focus on in my opinion is grain run out if the grain changes direction throughout the handle, where it changes direction is possibly, and this is possibly, the weak link. That's where it could possibly break. All handles can break. It doesn't matter how perfect the, the grain is. It can break just as easy, easily as, as one that's messed up. Yeah. But I get people want to give themselves, they want to set themselves up for success. So they, you know, start with the right grain orientation to begin with. Right. That's great. The problem is there just aren't that many handles. <laughs> it's just not, it's just not economical. Um, and then the other thing is, is people aren't really, they're not being really truthful with themselves. A lot of people hang a lot of axes. Um, how many axes can you possibly use? Mm. Like, you're one man. So I, I know there's a percentage of people that use their axes on a daily basis, but um, a majority of us are collectors. So we're so wrapped up in this grain orientation on a handle that that's going to hang on a wall. And I'm not trying to be a prick. I'm just being realistic. <laughs> it, you, might, you might swing it, but the, the reality is, is you're probably not. Now, I'm a firm believer of making everything right so it is usable, but I'm not going to let a perfectly, the lack of a perfectly straight grain handle, you know, internet perfect, um, deter me from Yeah, I, I would agree that right up until like something really curvy like a French curve, and I'm only taking that position because I watched one blow apart because... It arcs back over itself. There's such an open area, you know, between the, you know, the belly and the bottom of the handle that, you know, the I watched the curve, the the run out was bad. That's why the handle broke. I mean, it is, yeah. it's it's a little harder to avoid, I think, with those really curvy. But I'll be honest, I I did a curved half um, craftsman head for a buddy years ago, that was completely running the opposite direction. But it just had a few runs of grain running through the whole thing. That axe is still swinging strong. And he uses that for his fireplace. He uses that for his camping. Uh, there it is. You know, um, I've got a, my outdoor axe isn't, isn't a perfectly straight grain, but it's a 36 inch, uh, straight handle. I honestly don't care what the grain looks like when it's a straight haft. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, less, if it, yeah, it's less important. If it's clean, if the handle's a nice shape, it's not bent all over the place. I'm going to, I'm going to use it. And I got my dogs flipping out because somebody beat their horn. It's all right, buddy. But uh, yeah, I have a I have a jersey. It's my most used axe, and the grain is uh, is one hundred percent wrong. Mm -hmm. And including over strikes and all, <laughs> the the handle still has not failed. And and I hung that. It's one of the very first axes I ever hung properly. Well, and it wasn't even properly. It was at that time. It was to the best of my knowledge. Um. And, and I, I keep saying one of these days when it breaks, I'll replace it. But it hasn't. 
And, and I use that one. If I'm out here playing, having a fire in the backyard, that's the axe I grab. Um, I've split many, many, many pieces of wood with that axe and, and cut down a couple of trees with it. It just, it hasn't broke. And, you know, and another thing to say on that, and the reason why I think we, we bring this up um, subconsciously is, is chasing handle grain and, you know, a few other things that we'll cover can really spoil your fun um, like if the, if you spend months on the endless search for a handle, you're really missing, you're missing out. I think you're near in your walk with the ax collecting. Um, it's easy to go down these rabbit holes on stuff. And you know why? Because I can say that because I've been there. <laughs> so, you know, like learn from our, our wasted time and mistakes, uh, as it were. And, and here's the thing, you know, if you're buying the handles locally at a hardware store, um, Chances are you're paying ten to twelve dollars for a handle, maybe fourteen on the high end. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're worried about the grain, buy two. So you already know how to hang it. Um, hang the axe, go swing, and if it breaks, do it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's it. not that big of a deal. But if you're going to sell it, it has to be internet perfect. Yeah, it's got to be internet perfect. <laughs> it, you know, that's that's. That mentality it bleeds over to that, doesn't it? So now here comes the buyer who's obsessed with it, who won't, who won't buy an axe off of somebody because of it. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's um, it's a bad rabbit hole to go down. Well, see, then, go ahead. I I see it firsthand being a Snow and Ely dealer. You know when I call them and and order order uh, axes. This is so this is an Amish company that has no internet. They don't have a clue what's going on on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but they're they're knowledgeable of the grain orientation because their customers <laughs> educated them <laughs> mm -hmm. and they're like you know we warranty our handles so the the amount of handles that we've actually replaced or had to warranty is next to nothing yeah so they're just not they're concerned about run out and that's where it ends they don't they, they don't select any handles that have run out um, the grain may be 45, it may be straight, it doesn't matter as long as it doesn't have run out. And, and this company doesn't warrant, I mean, they haven't had to warranty any axes. I can't remember what he told me, it was just like a stupid number, like two in the last five years. Yeah, that's not exactly an issue. <laughs> yeah. And with that, um, heartwood and sapwood, there's another one that's uh, that that's one of the bigger topics, I think, that cause uh dissension and then you bring up the the um forest service study on it too but that's more i think that's the forest service study kind of shows that if you had a handle handle of all heartwood or a handle of all sapwood you don't really have any there's no real difference going on as far as strength goes but when you start splitting them together apparently that's where you run into issues yeah uh, i've done several axes I've sold several axes that had a mixture of, um, haven't seen an issue yet. So I, I mean, I guess, uh, I don't know. I personally think it's nothing. I don't, I don't know what the big worry is. Uh, swing it till it breaks and put a new one in. Um, you know, I guess some safety sallies get real concerned that there's some safety issue there, but I mean, like if you're swinging right next to your buddy's head, then I think you got a whole nother problem, but. I don't know. I really don't have a, it's a, I know it's a big, it's a huge topic. I just don't really have a whole a lot of position on it. I don't really care to be honest with you. So I think the theory is this, the, the heartwood is, is a denser, harder wood and the sapwood is a softer, lighter wood. Maybe more springy. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, more spring versus dude, if you, you can tell the difference in your swing, <laughs> <laughs> come on realist really like who swings an axe these days and can tell the the difference i mean at the end of the day it's hickory right and this this is why we use hickory or ash because of its its character characteristics yeah hardness to hardness to toughness right yeah yeah um i don't know i just i just think it's i think it's one more thing to worry about that you don't need to worry about yeah, I don't think I'd, I. It's not on my radar. I some of the say the word the prettiest handles I've ever had had a mixture of hardwood sapwood going through them. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, especially if you octagonal them. I had one. I even now I'm like, why did I sell that? I don't know why I sold that. But yeah, I don't. I don't think it's worth spending a whole lot of time on. But I've seen there's th- there's on the forums uh, on the old antiquated web forums. There, I mean, the the uh, the topic got heated and endless over something that I just never. I don't know. I just didn't think it ne- needed that much attention. So I don't know. I've it's never. Easy. Seen, I've never seen any proof of. Why not to use it? That's the thing. You see the arguments, but where's the proof? Where's yeah, the I've, ne- I've never seen a somebody said I broke ten handles in a row, and here are the pictures and video of a breaking at the Sapwood Heartwood, uh, where where they where they meet. I yeah, maybe maybe there needs to be some evidence of it. Um, but then, like again, I, it's a personal experience. I've never never run into an issue. So, um. Ninja Shell, somebody brought this up in the chat last night. Uh, I avoid it. If you don't, that's your problem in the end. I don't really care. Um, I think you. the only downside to Ninja Shelving might be is you set yourself up a couple percussion points below the head for for some splits to happen. Um, and if, if, uh, and for those people who don't understand what we're talking about, you're not into the lingo ninja shelving is when you shape a neck out and you bring, and you bring the head down in the neck, you've created a, a flat plane on the handle. Instead of shaving it all down to lead into the eye, there's a shelf in which the head comes and sits down on a little bit. And I think if you percussion, if you, you hit something hard enough and, uh, the head maybe has a wiggle or a move, you can, you've created a point where you can you could chip off wood or blast down a crack or something like that. Create a weak spot. Yeah, you could hit a weak spot. Um, I've seen some, I've, I've seen so many axes. It's like, I've seen some from companies that had a little bit going on. Then I've seen some that are just, it's, it's hugely dramatic. Um, so it's kind of all over the place, but the heads are still on there. And the handles are still together. To each your own. I prefer to lead my handles into the uh, into the eye and and leave it at that. I think the I think the thing with the ninja shelf is um, it's a proven fact that if you have any any structure that makes a ninety degree turn, is the most likely place for it to break. So you see it in like knife making or. Um, leather work or anything if if you have we'll use leather for an example if you have a 90 degree joint and you pull on both opposite sides of that it's more likely to rip at that joint but if you curve it it's more likely to tear somewhere else it makes a much stronger joint so when you put the ninja shelf in there the theory is if when you're swinging this axe, instead of having a nice curved transition into the bottom of the eye, you've got this step that's mm-hmm. now a weak link, and it could it could possibly break. Um, I've seen extreme cases of it where people um, YouTube videos where they they literally carve the the freaking handle out, and there's like a quarter inch shelf, and then they yeah. set the head on. Well, the head can't go down anymore after that, so it's it is it's just where it is. Um, yeah, I mean, it, is it like extremely, uh, critical or crucial? Like if you're just setting a head and it happens to cut into the wood a little bit, uh, that's not as crucial as like if you're carving it out. So is it, it's, it's better to have a nice smooth transition. Plus it looks better. So it's one of those fine details that you have to work on and decide if, if it's that important to you. Yeah. I think as setting your, setting your head, you get it to some degree. I mean, I come in with my knife, you know, and I shave it under the eye. If I get any tiny bit of curl just for the, you know, the, I've already gone that far. I might as well make it extra clean. But other than that, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, to each your own. If it's something you like to do, then well, it's your problem. <laughs> When it comes down to it, in the end, um, <laughs> this I think it's one of Chris's favorites: uh, leaning your axe on a wall for storage. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, so, 
Yeah, tell them, tell, tell the myth and then the malarkey and then, uh, you know, to differentiate, differentiate between the two. <laughs> so the thing is, is if you lean your axe against the wall, apparently some magical force will cause it to bow towards the wall, um, which is not completely untrue. I've, no, there, there's a degree of which this could happen, but it's the uh, it's the I've outrage. Seen, yeah, I've seen many axes with with a bowed handle, and I would suspect that that's probably what caused it to happen. Um, is it going to happen overnight? No, absolutely not. And that's uh, literally where we're coming from with this one. Um, people so excited over it that they're willing to put themselves out there that, oh, you can't do that at any time whatsoever for any reason and we're not kidding my, we're not kidding <laughs> my personal experience with this is i had just finished an axe and i took i took a glamour shot um to share and i leaned the axe against the wall and within the first few comments somebody said oh you can't do that you're gonna you're gonna bow your handle and it was literally like dude i just put it there to take a picture and I don't think that would happen for probably years. Nope, it'll happen overnight. Yeah, it'll be overnight, bowed. overnight. It'll be bowed tomorrow. And this guy was still a matter of time. Yeah, that's and that's the way I've heard it too. Oh, it can only take a day. Uh, listen, I got axes sitting out in my breezeway over there that are all stood up straight at a tent, like a what ten degree lean maybe against the wall. They've bought a couple of them have been there since I moved in. And every handle is still straight. So I'm not, that's not exactly high on my, on my priority list. And I put it in with that malarkey crap. Um, if, 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 if you got to go around making comments about people not to do that, I seriously suggest you take a inner look at yourself <laughs> and you know what your priorities are at. But it's just one of those things. It's just one of those eye rolls when I see somebody make a comment about it. Like I don't, my axes don't usually stay in one position for very long. <laughs> no, no, except for them over there that I don't, I'm not worried about. Yeah, my mind move around. I've had them out in my. Here's a test for you. I had what five sitting in my shop window with the sun on it half the day. I mean, certainly with that much that much rays on it, the handles they're all leaning up against the up the window there in the shop. None of them, none of them took a turn over a year period. Not not a one of them. So. Um, I think we can leave that one to the malarkey crap. You know, if you yeah, if you put it at forty five degrees in a barn for the next ten years, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say you probably you might gonna see some bow in the bow in the handle. And I've seen people post where they've been sitting in a barn for decades, and obviously, obviously, but uh, overnight for a week or something like that, yeah, I, I I'd have to see the proof. Yeah. Um, it, I have I did have a handle bow on me. As I was making it, or not making it, but fitting it to an eye, um, or actually I fit it to the eye and I was, I think I was octagoning the handle or something. Yeah, I remember that because you were sending me pictures as it was happening. Yeah. And it was almost like I was watching it bow right in front of me. Yeah. But that's a rare case. I mean, it can't that, be. That was grain. I'm going to say that was something grain tension or I don't know, something along those lines. And I think it was grain tension and, and um, probably not. 100% dried wood. Yeah. And once I started relieving some of the the thickness, it literally bowed like right in front of my eyes. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's one out of hundreds. <laughs> and this one, I don't see a whole lot of contention over, but it does. People take some real opinions on this. Um, is uh, I put down handle soaking. Yeah. And I. I, you know, it's another one of those things. It's like, I, I think I could get the same results wiping oil on and off and soaking over periods of time. So I, I don't see it as a huge issue. Um, some people take some real hard stances on it. Um, I do both. So I don't know. I don't know what you think. Have any personal shots at on it, but. You know, I don't, I just don't do it because I don't have the tank or the excess boil lensi oil. And I'm completely content with just wiping my handle down. Um, yeah, if, yeah, go ahead. I don't, I just don't like, to me, I, I literally put no thought into it. I, I don't see how it could hurt you. Um, but I don't see a huge benefit either. 
so it's it's one of those things where people get so passionate about it, but there's really no reason to. Yeah, we can all come to the same results in the end with. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Um, but like I said, yeah, I don't, I don't see it as a huge contention, but it does. People do seem to take positions on it. Yeah. Um, here's a here's a big one, uh, which I I think has some of the the most uh, hilarious responses to is uh, grinding the bit or sanding the bit. <laughs> I mean, I I think Chris and I have seen, and everybody else who's experienced, have seen more hilarious opinions and comments on that particular issue, I think, than, I don't know, probably anything, man. Even the handle leaning, because, I mean, with the extreme position, if you don't know what we're talking about, is anytime you put some friction to the bit, you're ruining the temper. Uh you know, as somebody who's made knives for years, um, I think a lot of people are just completely clueless about how steel steel works. Now, I guess, you know, let's say most steels are annealed or you can bring them down in their temper in that 400 degree range. You know, it's really easy for me. I use a two by 72 to shape and all are to uh, sharpen most of my axes. Um. I don't anytime have the bit to a point where I can't put my hand on it. And if it was 400 degrees, I'd have a pretty bad burn. Um, I've never seen it affect a temper. Uh, Now a case could be made grinding on a bench grinder on a hard stone on high speed and the, and the, and the bit getting blaze orange. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, all right. You're, you're doing damage at that point. But uh, to, to go after people who use an orbital sander or uh, you're, you're coming so far out of left field. It's not even funny. Um, I mean, we have who, who might be the only professionals, le- one of the only professional things left, like um, uh, timber sports guys are using giant buffing orbitals to, you know what I mean? And these jigs to do these giant fan blades uh, edges with and stuff like that. Uh, they're the last thing on their mind is how, how hot the, how hot the bit is getting because it's not getting that hot. And go ahead if you got anything to say you want to say on that. I would just say like we live in a time where where information is so easily available to us. Before you make a, a comment about you're going to ruin that temper, why don't you take five minutes to educate your educate yourself on heat treat? <clears throat> like you can literally learn all about heat treat in five minutes on the internet. You won't be an expert at it, but you'll have a better understanding. And it was like you said, if you can hang on to it, you haven't touched the tempering point yet. You haven't yeah. changed any anything about that steel. So yeah, not a thing. And and you haven't held caution. it there for an hour, you know. Yeah. yeah. Proceed with caution. Yeah. <laughs> like know your own ability, educate yourself, and uh have fun with it. Stop being a freaking Internet. Yeah, I think what what's that one extreme opinion that uh, him him and some people who liked it, which I, which means it, which tells me that there is more than just him that uh, that was thinking about that is uh, even putting a stone to the bit is really yes. the time. I'm like, well, how do you sharpen your axe at some point? I mean, at what at what point is this getting ridiculous? And you want to think that they're just being a troll, but like, oh no, this person's actually being serious. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead. No, I was just saying it's ridiculous. Wall hangers. I think. Did you have something you wanted to to bring up on that? Yeah, we kind of touched on this in other podcasts, but um, yeah, I see. There's a lot of macho-ness between you know making a wall hanger and making a user, and I don't really, I don't really feel that there's a reason to be so um stop looking at me. <laughs> my wife's looking at me she's distracting me there's no reason to be such a so opinionated about it like, yeah I, I'm a, I'd, I'd say emotional because that's how everybody does everything yeah, nowadays <laughs> they feel like if they get this old axe they gotta leave the patina in, intact and and leave the character there and and whatever because they use it well who cares yeah. what if i want to what if i want to mirror polish my axe and then use it it's my my axe it's my time what do you care 
why why does it have to be labeled a hall a wall hanger because i painted it you know stop with the labels it's an act yeah we're gonna lead into that here shortly um you know it's uh you know when it comes down aren't they can't they both be equally important the preservation the restoration and the and the archiving, so to speak, of these tools that are not made anymore. Most of these are not made anymore. Um, I hold, like, I don't know. It's like I have some Connecticut's that I intend to beat that crap out of, and I have some that will never see a bite of wood in my life. Um, they're just not going there anymore. So, uh, and I, you know, I don't know. I have equal, I have equal value to both of them. I don't know. Yeah. I don't need to because somebody spends the time to restore something. Um, I just don't have a the need to go out and force my opinion on them over it. I suppose not not on that, you know. Just, um, you know, and and like I say, uh, I'm not a perfect person and I'm not an expert. My opinions on some things have changed dramatically in the last five, well, maybe a little bit longer, eight years, maybe. Um, but we'll, you know, we're coming to that shortly too. And, uh, you had something on, uh, lottery ticket axes and you want (laughs) to, you want to define that for the people who might not be familiar with that term. So it just, it blows my mind at how many people come into these groups and not our groups, not as, as bad about it as some of the others, but, and it's just due to size. Um, but People come in, they just bought, like they literally, they're in their car. They just left the flea market and they got an ax in their lap and they take a picture of it. Can anybody give me any information about this? What they want you to say is, oh yeah, that's that's a rare, ultra rare $10,000 ax is what they want. They think every ax is a lottery ticket. Like that's their, their that's it. I'm going to Disneyland. Yeah. And it's just not the case. <laughs> I see that I see that and maybe maybe I'm being a little a little greedy but like I I don't even know the proper term but like I see people ask constantly anybody know how old it is well no but what difference does it make you know like is it change anything um obviously if it's a newer Collins (laughs) I think some people might be genuinely interested in age, but I think what you're and I think you're on track with is more people are equating the age with what value they can get out of it. And it's clear as day when they do it. Yeah. They're looking for the lottery ticket. It's literally. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those I don't want to paint everybody with a brush, but it's uh if you got some of you guys. I, I imagine those aren't people that are going to listen to an, a podcast about axes, but you know, you're the, you're the kind. <laughs> I, I don't like doing this, I like give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but you're kind of ruining it, you know what I mean? For you stick out like a sore thumb. Um, a lot of us roll our eyes at you, and uh, generally, if you know, you can find people that you know, you they seem earnest, they just want information, but the other ones they kind of stick out like a sore thumb, usually because they're repeat offenders of it, too. Yeah, um, and you can you know. tell, like, if a guy's sitting in his car and there's a picture of a steering wheel in the background, he literally just left the antique store and he's already asking value, yeah, well, he's obviously in it for that, you know. Yeah. I mean. I don't know. I when I'm when I'm buying stuff, if the price is questionable to me, I do the research while I'm standing there in the store holding it in my hand. And that's key. You, you, you know what? Stuff, make sure you pick it up. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. You bring that up. Um, this is in no way me going to somebody and going, "Am I paying too much for this at this antique store?" I I know there's some fine line going in between those two two topics but i mean we're everybody should be there to help everybody else but i don't want to see people ripped off either right um but you know that's like i said too that would it'd be clearly obvious you know they're they're gonna if it's somebody who's looking to um to to spin it right around for value they're probably not going to be asking a lot of people how much they should pay for it and just trying to lowball the person trying to sell it so yeah the person that takes a picture of the price at the antique store and and questions it they're not that's not the lottery ticket. The lottery no. ticket the guy that already bought it and he's he's already looking for age and value on the thing. And how rare? Is it rare? Like that's those are like trigger words. 
<laughs> you know right away, hey, you just bought a lottery ticket. Yay for you. Like, but no, it's not. You didn't buy a lottery ticket. I hear you. And you know, we had other other things to lean into, but I think um as we were talking about wall hangers and stuff like that, I think we'll roll right into this and we'll we'll be up in an hour, I think, at that point. Um the labels on everything and i the one at the top of my list was uh i guess you coined that phrase hipster dip but the guy called it doing the hipster thing i think is it was something silly it's it's just this is just the topic to lean into this quick discussion but um somebody broad stroked everybody who used vinegar to remove rust as being hipsters and it was just the it was just one of those things chris and i immediately got onto the on our phones like is this guy for real um I don't know if you wanted to say something on that before I keep going, but uh. I just—I mean, it speaks for itself. We've—it does. It does. We've completely made a mockery of it. Um, Stickers coming soon. Yeah, yeah. It's. I think it. Go ahead. Go ahead. uh, Just the the thought that you're a hipster because you clean your axe is just—it's just ludicrous to me. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. In the woodworking world, lots of people restore hand planes. Are they hipsters? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. What about what about uh, everything uh, one of our favorite YouTubers does? Um, hand tool rescue is is him taking all that time to to bring these tools in original working order and looks. Is that is that all hipster too? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny. I bet you the. Uh, these guys that run around with that with that brush all the time would would not say that, but just but for some reason do it in the axe community. Um, I, they probably wouldn't think twice about the hand plane that's in original condition, brought back with all original parts, or a car. I think you made that point one time. What do you restore a car for? Back to so original, you, yeah. Like why so bother? You, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So just so you can be labeled a hipster. Yeah, so is, I mean, is Jesse James a hipster? Yeah, I know, right? Go tell him that. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, with that, you know, it's like the painting of the heads and the wall hangers, and you know, I made this point either the last podcast or the one before. You know, like I said, if Kelly Kelly came out today with those nice catalogs and all the painted head versions that they had coming out and all the marketing that went into these, uh, you know. Uh, a sizable hand for these guys would be calling them a hipster. They'd be call, they'd be doing what they did to best made, which I was a part of that, you know, when they first came out like 10 years ago um, until I grew up. Um, they would get that broad brush hipster. They'd be, they'd be you know, um, just, I don't know, labeled and, uh, and thrown aside by that opinion. And, you know, what I see in the axe community, you know, what, you know, I guess, I guess maybe somewhere out there, somebody's dressing like a lumberjack and, doesn't do anything with axes but at what point at what point do these guys who are using tools restoring working sharpening their axes going out and learning how to use them at what point does the do they transition you know what i mean i guess is what's getting on my nerves um uh i was i like i said i was one of these fools that um like gave best made co a huge amount of of uh of guff when they first started and yeah some things they do are really funky you know what i mean but you know in the end uh they're (laughs) guess what guys they're keeping axe community alive you know um these guys that uh that you know just to do the restorations maybe they're they're not swinging as much maybe there's just the axe throwing guys i think they're the new ones that are going to start getting the label because they're, you know, they're doing all the axe throwing clubs and stuff. Hey, they're keeping axe culture alive. We got, a, we had just had a bunch of them flood into our group, and I think yeah. it's, I think it's great. I think it's great personally. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I'm starting to see get to the point where I'm, you know, a couple of these guys keep popping up that just want to start hammering others for, you know, what they do or how they paint their head or if they clean, you know, they choose to clean an axe and put it on the wall or preserve the tool maybe have some serious insecurity problems when they just start calling everybody hipsters. And I think it's, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's not even old anymore. It's kind of, um, it's kind of telling and it's kind of sad. I think at this point is where I've come to it. So that might be a little controversial for people. Um, I don't, I don't care. 
you know, I don't care. I'm, I think I'm, I'm well over it for a few years. I think in any way, shape or form, people step into the ax community. Um, and if that means they want to sell, be, uh, like best, not to pick on best made co if they're anybody's listening. Um, if you want to sell painted finished axes like that, Hey, Kelly was doing it, uh, 90 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and and hardened lumberjacks who would put you to shame every day were buying them. So I think people need to take a hard look at themselves sometimes the way they they go after people. And like I said, my hands raised. I was guilty of that as well. I've come around. Maybe I can help somebody else take a take a moment to realize it as well. But uh, I mean, at some point, these especially like the younger kids in their twenties and teens and stuff getting into this. I don't care how they look. You know, they're they're dressing like a lumberjack or not i don't care anymore if he's wearing a fedora and a vintage flannel but he's out busting his busting wood guess what i mean he's in you know what i mean right i i yeah, I'm, i think i'm over it at this point maybe it's just because i'm approaching 40 you know i just but uh you know that was my rant if chris wants to expand on that i more than welcome there no well, it sums it up i mean it's just Guys, just be nice to one another and take a take an open mind approach to this hobby. Just put down the labels, put down your man your man card for or manliness, whatever you want, your macho ness. Put that all away. Be real with yourself. Be honest with yourself. You know, and uh, have fun. It's a fun hobby. Yeah, it's it's uh it's political less. It's um contra I mean, other than I don't know, it it really should be controversial topic less. Oh. Yeah, people just they get too passionate about their their thought processes and and uh their methods. There's no it's not really a right or wrong way of things. So it, I think people get caught up in that, you know, they get, uh, they learn one way and then it's this way or no way. And I, th I think there's, you're losing out. There's a lot more to learn. You are losing out. Um, I was, like I said before, I was guilty of it. I used to give people guff for taking the time to paint heads and, uh, preserve axes like that. And I was the worst for it because it's like a whole new, depth to the the restoration process the use process the you know the collecting process um yeah yeah i guess we're on the same page with that yeah and uh at least you know our podcast sets alone from the group but it is part of it as well everybody's welcome um and these guys that uh you know that just i think they're i think the insecurity level is so high i mean they they usually end up fading themselves out anyway so Oh, uh, with that, is there anything else you wanted to bring up? No. Bring them up as they pop up. It's more, yeah, like, it's more, yeah, it's I mean, more I poking fun of it than it is saying it's right or wrong. It is. We're not, yeah, don't, yeah, don't, don't take everything too seriously. I, you know, I, I labeled this segment um, or episode Myths and Malarkey. We could do another Myths and Malarkey part two, like, next year. You know, it's, you know, a lot of weird things come up. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to say also for our fourth podcast, get a guest on. What do you think about that? Let's drag somebody else on here. Absolutely. We need to, we, we should do that. That we, uh, breaks things up a little bit. Definitely get somebody on. Um, with that, everybody, uh, after this podcast, I'll be able to start getting statistics, but I would like to thank everybody who's been, uh, liking and sharing and uh i have <laughs> i'm sure it'll happen but i've yet to see any really negative feedback on any of them yet I, I, I there's no not any there has been no i've got no negative feedback i've got nothing but positive reinforcement yeah uh, all uh, tons of people reaching out and, and just out of the woodwork hey listen to the podcast today thanks for doing this and we appreciate that yeah, we do. And, uh, you know, we encourage you um, to share the podcast. It's not just for our group. Um, it's available on Google and Apple. You can share the direct link as you find it. Um, but by all means, put it into the uh, 
the other tool forms where people might be interested in that type of thing. Uh, we always appreciate it. And with that, I guess we'll, we'll close until next time. And uh, we'll see everybody later. See you guys.